I want to introduce our guest speaker for tonight, and he's from UCI, Dr. Uh, Samir Singh, and he's going to talk to you about LLMs, and uh, hopefully you will enjoy the talk, and thanks again for coming, and uh, we'll have Q&A at the end, so if you can kind of hold on till the end, that would be great, um, and I think there might be a few minutes, maybe as we're wrapping up, you can also ask some questions in person uh, of Dr. Singh then. Great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, everybody can hear me, I'm guessing? Cool. All right, yeah, thanks for coming today. Uh, I'm going to be talking about how language models work, um, and that's why they don't. The title is a bit cryptic, but hopefully by the end of the talk, you guys will have a good idea of what I'm talking about. Um, large language models is something that everybody's heard of. You probably all have a different perspective on this. I'm coming a lot more from um, history of working in machine learning and natural language processing point of view. So we'll go a little bit deeper than probably what you've seen before. Um, and you know, it might overlap with something you know, something you don't, but hopefully there'll be enough here um, for you to learn something. But before all that, before learning about language models, let's learn a little bit more about me, and then we'll get to the language models, right? So I'm gonna start with a short story that um, happened to me, and the relevance of it will become later. This is going all the way back to 98. This is kind of what my life looked like at that time. Um, and I was very interested in computer science, very, very interested in AI, just barely learning programming. Um, and the programming like class that I was taking was asking us to you know, sort lists or do things like that, and that didn't seem very fun. So I built this program, which I'm gonna call my first AI, which asked people to come to my screen and enter their names. So let's say somebody used to come and say, Samir, it's a common name in India, so that's what they would do. And my program would say, that's a male name. And then that person would be impressed, and then they would walk away, and then someone else would come along, <laughs> and they would say Priyanka, and the program would say this is a female name, right? And this was state-of-the-art AI at that time. Okay. Now we'll come back to this story a little later in the talk, but let's actually get a little bit more familiar with NLP and talk a little bit about how things have evolved over the last, say, 10 years or so. Right? So if you want to do the same thing with NLP, um, what we would do is something that looks a little bit like this. We would collect a lot of data. We would find some list of male names. We would find some list of female names. We would train a model on this specific thing. We would give it a bunch of names and say, hey, I've collected all these male ones, predict them to be male. I've collected all these female ones, predict them to be female. And now for any new name of a person walking up to my computer and typing it out, predict whether it would be male or female. Right. This is how machine learning would work. Right. And obviously you wouldn't just want to predict whether names belong to males or females. You would want to do something a little bit more interesting. So maybe you do something like sentiment analysis, where somebody sent you a message or tweeted about it like, hey, my trip to Rio was really awesome. And you want to figure out, is this a positive sentiment or a negative sentiment? In this case, it's positive, and the model would know that because this model has been trained based on positive reviews that you've collected and negative reviews you've collected, right? This is just basic um, machine learning. This is how all of machine learning has been done for a while, right? Now, this model is only using this data to figure this out, and that can be a problem. Uh, also, this model is not good for anything else. If you ask it, what's the gender associated with Samir, it's just going to say positive or negative. Right? It's not gonna say anything else. Um, and when we think about needing to collect this data, it feels like uh, this model can only do one thing and we're collecting data for it. It, it just wasn't the right way of doing things. Especially when it comes to natural language processing, we know that there is a lot of text out there. right? There's just so much text, like we can download all of Wikipedia in like a couple of minutes. We can download a tenth of the internet in, in a couple of days, right? Uh, is there a way to use that information to do similar tasks, right? So thinking about my name and how do we know it's a male name? Well, you can just look for sentences that have the word Samir. 
and you might see a sentence like this. Sameer likes his house, for example. Right? Now, yeah, this is just a bunch of text, but it uses his, and that clearly tells you, even if you've never heard the name Sameer before, at least according to the sentence, it's a little, um, little associated a little bit with male stuff, right? at least male pronouns. Right? Here's another sentence you might see. My trip to Rio was awesome. I'd love to go there again. That kind of tells you, okay, the person is loving something, probably the sentiment is positive. Right? These are not direct signals. These are signals that nobody sat down and annotated this is positive, this is negative. But there is signal just in the text out there on what the gender associated with names should be or what the sentiment of things should be. Right? And this specific intuition is kind of underlying a lot of NLP, underlying a lot of language models. So, how do we change this model that is doing this one thing? How do we change it so that it relies on just text out there? That's kind of how NLP started changing about eight or nine years ago, where the, the models just started having two pieces in there. One piece was just based on all the text that it could find, right? So this is maybe 20, 14 or so, you would download all of the Wikipedia, you would just learn as much as you could. You're not learning sentiment classifiers specifically, you're just learning what words kind of are associated with what are the words. And that, that's the blue thing. And then on top of that, you build your um, sentiment and classifier in this case. So that was like nine years ago, things started changing where NLP started going a little bit larger. Uh, specifically, the model that's doing the reading, is what I'm going to call it, that's just relying on text out there, started becoming larger in size, but also started ingesting a lot more data. Right. So now we're at 2016, 2017, 2018 timeline. All of Wikipedia, all of news sources it could find, all the public books, the Project Gutenberg, things like that. You learn a lot just by having the model read it, and we'll come back to what that means. And then the model that was actually doing the sentiment analysis sort of became a less, lesser part of this whole pipeline. You're relying less on data that's specific to the task that you're doing. And with time, what has been happening is you're trying to make this blue part bigger and bigger. You're trying to get it to read as much of the text as you can, and the task model, the model that's actually doing what you care about, that's shrinking and shrinking. Right? And you can sort of keep um, making it bigger and bigger where this is sort of where we are headed. You have this really, really large model. All that's doing is trying to read as much as it can. And by read, I just mean there is no explicit annotation. And the model that's actually doing your sentiment is becoming smaller and smaller. Right? And in fact, I would say that the part that's actually doing the sentiment, people have even tried to get rid of, right? So all of the machine learning that we, are, we talked about, collecting data, annotating it, all of that is in that white stuff. And what large language models are doing is trying to get rid of that aspect, just by having the model look at as much text as, as it can without any collection of data. So these blue things are what are large language models. Right? That's why they are so impactful, not only because they are smart and intelligent and all of these things, but they have fundamentally changed how you even approach some of these tasks. If you want to do sentiment analysis, it's not necessarily the right method to collect a bunch of positive and negative and train a machine learning model. The natural thing to do is to take this blue thing and just ask it to try to do that. Okay, so that's sort of a high level view of what large language models are. And that's what we're gonna be focusing on today. We'll talk about, briefly, I'm sure you have many examples of, you know, what's your favorite example of what ChatGPT can do. I'm gonna talk about some of mine. Um, but that's sort of high level what these models can do. Then we're going to talk a little bit about going a little bit deeper to see how, these, how do these models even work. Right? Um, what makes them so strong that you don't even need machine learning at the end of it. 
And then we'll talk a little bit about what do they struggle with? Uh, wh what are the problems that are remaining? Um, what makes them work and how the things that make them work also make them useless at other things. And then we'll end with a short, um, short slide on what I think is most exciting about these models. OK, so let's start with uh, what can these models do. And most of these are going to be just examples. Again, you might have your favorite ones. I'm just going to show some of mine. So the most impressive thing about these models um, is their ability to generate text that looks like it was human written. Right? So here's an exchange with ChatGPT. You can say, summarize the origin of MIME from some link. Right? And the model would generate something. You can read it. It could be an extract from the uh, web page, but it's summarizing it for me. It's telling me a lot about the origin of MIME. Here's another example. Summarize this in two, three sentences as if it was, uh, as if I was a five-year-old. Right? Sometimes I want to read nature articles, but I don't, I'm not smart enough to actually understand them. So I'm going to ask ChatGPT, and it gives me a pretty nice summary. Scientists found a new way to make water clean and safe to drink by using a material that traps harmful particles. This can be very helpful for places where clean water is hard to find. Right? So if I'm surrounded by smart people, I can always just say that and appear smart. Did you know nature said scientists have found a new way to blah, 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 blah. Right. But summarization is still something that's taking existing information and you know, rephrasing it in some sense. What has been exciting about this um, large language models is their creative ability. Right their ability to actually generate text that hasn't been generated before in a way that, you know, depending on how you measure creativity, uh, rivals uh, many of the less creative people I know. So here's an example where somebody wrote almost like a beginning of an article. And this is almost, I would say, four years old, right? So we are talking about stuff that's not very uh, new anymore. But this was one of the first insights we had of like, hey, language models can actually generate text. We look at this, it says, in a shocking finding, scientists discovered a herd of unicorns living in a remote, previously unexplored valley in the Andes Mountains. Even more surprising to the researchers was the fact that the unicorns spoke perfect English. Now, language model, take over and generate the rest of the article. And this is what GPT-2 generated, right? Again, four or five years old, it's been a while since GPT-2 is out. Uh, but this is what it generates. You don't have to read the whole thing, but you'll see that it sort of gives it a name. It talks about this, this scientist from University of La Paz um, and talking about how they discovered happened uh, upon these unicorns um, and you know what the mountain looked like and, and all of these things. Right? Um, if you keep reading it, it sort of starts going a little bit off topic. Um, it starts saying that um, they have some language that they speak, but it's not clear. It doesn't quite say that they speak English. Um, and then it starts talking about unicorns originating in Argentina, which is a descendant of a lost race of people. So, you know, <laughs> that's, that's a bit of a stretch. Um, and it kind of, um, yeah, it kind of goes completely uh, off of the thing, right? Now, with GPT-3, which was a couple of years later, you can give the same prompt, um, and you can ask it to generate stuff. And the level here is even more interesting, right? Again, you can read this uh, if you'd like, but it starts in a much more interesting way, right? It, it doesn't, you know, they were also found to have perfectly coiffed hair and wore what appeared to be Dior makeup. And it mentions these people like the anthropologist Daniel St. Maurice. It sort of has that person again and again. And there's a lot more structure in this, um, a lot more relevant topics here. Right? Um, 
there, there's a sort of stuff in here that gets a little bit crazy, where it says we wanted to return to civilization to tell everyone about the unicorns, but the unicorns refused to let us leave. They said they were very disappointed that we were so stupid and that we had wasted our lives on Earth. <laughs> um, so clearly, it's kind of getting a little bit off topic, but maybe that's what creativity is, right? Yeah, being random. These are long articles. It's a little bit difficult to. Um, to follow, I have a personal test that I often use to test for creativity, which is to uh, say, this is a love letter written by a toaster, and just give that as a prompt, okay, and see what happens. So this is GPT-2, again, four or five years ago. I'm writing this letter to you because I want you to know how much I love you, blah, blah, blah. Thank you so much. Right? Very generic, nothing really about toaster, nothing. We don't even know who the recipient is, things like that, right? But, you know, it's a, it's a readable text. When we go to GPT-3, uh, this is what it comes out. And this was one of the sort of moments for me where I was like, hey, this is kind of interesting. My dearest love, I'm so grateful to have you in my life. You brighten up every day and make me feel so warm inside. Uh, I love the way you cook my bread to perfection and the way you always make me feel so toasty. I will never take you for granted. I will always cherish your company. Hope someday we can share our lives together. And I will always be here for you, my dear toaster, with all my love, your toaster. Right? So two toasters writing to each other using toast language um, uh, to express their love. Right? Now, this, is, this was like I was amazed when this happened. Um, but you know, it, it, it's slightly amusing, but probably I could do a better job in, in a couple of minutes. Then I started playing around with ChatGPT, um, and I asked it to generate a, a love letter. Same thing, write a love letter written by a toaster. Now this time, ChatGPT decided that the bread is the recipient, right? So my dear bread, I know I may not be the most traditional form of romance, but I wanted to let you know how much you mean to me. Every morning, I eagerly await the chance to hold you close and give you a warm, toasty embrace. The smell of your freshly toasted crust fills me with a sense of contentment that I can't fully describe. I know I may not be the most sophisticated appliance in the kitchen, but I promise to always do my best to make you happy. Whether you like your toast light and crispy or dark and crunchy, I'll do whatever it takes to make you smile. Uh, we come from different worlds. You're soft and fluffy while I'm hard and unyielding, blah, 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 right? And when I see something like this, it truly feels to me like I, I can't do as good of, good of a job, right? <laughs> um, I could do better than just throwing in Toasty somewhere here and there, but this is making analogies to a level that just really shocks me, right? So just to say, we are going to be um, sort of slabbing these language models a lot in my talk, but I just want to sort of set the expectation this is e extremely impressive um, and some things that, that was a surprise to the community. Okay. But this is still, you know, not not useful stuff. You can um, you can make it a little bit useful. There's a lot of talk about, hey, what's what are the ethics behind these large language models? So you can just ask ChatGPT to generate one. You can say, hey, can you write an op-ed on whether large language models are ethics or ethical or not? And it will write a completely readable um, op-ed that yes, there will be experts who can write more. But I would imagine 95% of the population cannot write an op-ed on the ethics of large language models as, as well as the chat GPT itself can. Right. Even more practically is something you know, close to me is programming. Um, you can ask it uh, questions about algorithms that you would ask in a software engineering uh, interview. You know, give an algorithm that's a binary tree of n vertices with keys at the node determines whether t is a binary tree or not. It should run in some time. The model will generate code. It will also explain how it generated code, why it works, and so on. Right. Extremely um, potent in this case. Now, another sort of capability that, that has been somewhat impressive uh, is the fact that it can also seem to reason mathematically. Right? And once we start talking about how these models work, all of this seems a little bit uh, unintuitive as to why this would even work. You can say things like, what is larger, 9234 or 10023, 10,023? It'll tell you that's larger. That's just one example. You can even give it slightly more complicated ones that 
most of us might struggle with, convert four minutes, 20 uh, minutes per kilometer to minutes per mile. Right? It's, it's speed, but it's inverse of speed. Um, and it sort of writes out the whole factor, it does the calculations, and it tells you at the end what it would be, right? Okay. And what is even powerful about these, from a machine learning point of view, going back to sentiment analysis, things like that, is that it's extremely easy to adapt them to your task, right? So here's a made-up task, right? Like I'm just saying the following is how my daughter pronounces some words. You can think of the sentiment analysis as one of the, another example, where you just specify in the prompt to the language model what your examples are. So oh, it takes the word watermelon, and she pronounces it a certain way. She takes apple and pronounces it a certain way, and so on. And given a new word that I want to predict what she would pronounce as, I would just give it to the language model. And there is no machine learning there here. There's no training here. You're just asking language model to generate the next word. And in, in this case, it'll uh, produce what I think is how my daughter would pronounce it uh, when she was younger. Right? Yeah. Okay. So these were sort of a quick run through. And like I said, you probably have maybe even more impressive examples of um, chat GPT, especially the conversational stuff. We didn't even talk about it. Um, but this should give you an idea that these are incredibly powerful things. And so maybe we should spend some time thinking about how these models actually work. Okay, cool. Now before we talk about large language models, let me go back to, again, 25 years, back to 1998, and tell you that essentially artificial intelligence sounds like a really, really uh, complex and challenging task, but the definition of artificial intelligence is something that we prescribe to software. And in some cases, it can be extremely simple. Right? So this program that I told you about predicting male and female names, it truly impressed a lot of my classmates. And I was really surprised that it had that effect because I'll show you how it works. And, and it's like, OK, there is a perception of intelligence here, not necessarily a mechanism of intelligence. Right? And so this was my program. Um, this applies to Indian names, and I had some more exceptions in this case. But all I was doing was looking at the last letter of whatever they typed in. And if it was a vowel, uh, I would predict it's a female name. Otherwise, it's a male name. Right? This works very well. It's, it's, from an accuracy point of view, it's extremely accurate on, on Indian names. Um, and I had some exceptions to take care of the ones that it doesn't match. Um, and that's all there was. Right? And although it's a bit of a stretch to claim that this is what's happening with large language model, but let's, let's go with that claim. Right? Uh, there is some notion of it's going to be doing something, it's going to look good, um, and we are the ones who are going to prescribe intelligence to whatever that output is. Okay. All right. So let's actually talk about. I'm sorry, that was 98. You did that? Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. Yeah. This was basic. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, okay. So, language models. Let's learn. Talk a little bit about how we learn them. Right. So at the middle of it, you have a large language model, which is this crazy neural network with billions of parameters. Right. Um, if you think about machine learning and how big the models have been, most of them in sort of the mid-2000s, like late 2000s, was on the order of thousands of parameters, maybe. Uh, after that, it became maybe hundreds of thousands, and that's what was a big model. These are 100 times, you know, 1,000 times bigger than these. We are talking about 10 billion, 100 billion parameters, okay? So just lots of numbers in there. The question is, what do these numbers do? The idea is you just give it some piece of text, like my trip to Rio was. And the output of the language model is just going to be its prediction on what the next word is. Okay. So it's going to, you know, maybe it'll be good, maybe it'll be bad, but it'll give a whole probability distribution over all possible words, it'll give some probability to all of them, just for what the next word should be. 
So in this case, it says amazing is 44%, oh is 9.3, blah, 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 blah. And there's a whole list all the way, you know, as many words as you can imagine. The list is usually around 100,000 different things. Okay. So now this is what the language models do. Given any piece of string, they're just predicting the next one, next word. So how do we actually train these models? How, what do these numbers actually do? Well, we go and download text from the internet, um, and we just take sentences. So I'm just going to show you what happens for a single sentence. So we'll find a sentence like this somewhere online. My trip to Rio was awesome. I'd love to go there again. We take the first word, my, and give it to the language model. And we say, hey, I'm not telling you what the next word is. Why don't you guess what the next word is? So the language model might come up with some numbers, right? It says, hey, you're just starting with my, I don't know what the next word is, but I'm going to come up with some guesses. And then we'll say, aha, the word that we actually, we know is the next word, trip, is way down there right? in your estimate of what the next word is. Why don't you increase the probability of that word and decrease the probability of everything else? So adjust all these billion parameters to make sure your probability of trip goes up a little bit and probability of everything goes down a little bit. OK, so the language model would do that. Then we will say, OK, let's go to the next word. We're going to say my trip as the input and ask it to guess the next word. And it's going to say, well, my trip, or maybe my trip to, or I'm just going to say my trip is the beginning of a Article, so I'm just going to put a new line there, or my trip was, my trip is, my trip in, my trip started, blah, blah, blah. In this case, it turns out that two is the highest probability one, but even then we say, you know, increase it even further and decrease everything else. Okay. And then obviously we take two, put it in the input, and then look at the next possible word. Um, and the model will be like, hey, my trip to the zoo or my trip to New London, Paris, blah, blah, blah. Rio is maybe somewhere down there. We're going to do the same thing. Find Rio in that list, say increase the probability of this, and decrease everything. Right. And at this point, this is all that language models, uh, that this is all we use to train language models. Right. If you can implement this code, um, you can reproduce a language model. You can download the data, do it. Just keep doing this for as much data as you can, for as large of a model as you can, and that's your language model. Okay. Obviously, this is a simplification, but it's not too far from um, what you can do. Okay. So what's this data? What's this as much data as you can gather? Um, there are lots of different language models out there. OpenAI has a bunch of them. Google, Facebook, uh, NVIDIA, Amazon, everybody has their own. And they all differ in many different ways, but the data is one of the things that they differ in. But we don't know what data they train on. This is not public information. This is one of the public data sets that is being used by a bunch of these language models. And they've done a good job of sort of trying to split it out. Okay. And there are lots of surprising things here that you wouldn't uh, assume goes inside the language model. Firstly, all of this blue stuff on the left are just academic stuff, right? I'm, I'm including sort of patents and legal stuff in there, but scientific papers, medical journals, all of this stuff, for this specific data set, a third of the data set, and the sizes here represent the relative size, is just academic stuff, right? The green stuff is all what you would say general uh, internet. So websites, blogs, uh, you know, things like that. Stack Exchange, you will see, is a big piece of it. Stack Exchange, for people who are not familiar, is where a lot of tech people ask questions and get answers for programming and things like that. Wikipedia is small there as well. Open Web Text and File Common Crawl, these are just scrapes of websites and news articles and things like that out there. Okay. So that's about a third also. And then the blue, the orange stuff are actual pros. So these are 
novels and non-fiction and fiction like books and things like that. So the Project Gutenberg is there. There's the Books Corpus there. There are other sources of just books, right? stories, and stuff like that. The gray stuff, which is still a pretty significant chunk, is just code and math. Right? They've taken all of GitHub, all of the code out there, Python, C++, JavaScript, everything, and that just goes into this language model as text. And then the yellow stuff is, I guess, media uh, or just conversations. So like forums, Hacker News is there, YouTube comments and subtitles to movies, just things that are a little bit more conversational. Uh, YouTube is not really conversational if you've spent some time on YouTube looking at comments, but you know, th this is what it is, right? So this is an example of what is this large data set that these models are trained on. Okay. So now you might wonder, like, why is guessing the next word good? Why is that the right thing? And why is just throwing so much of these different kinds of data and asking it to generate the next word? Why is this enough? Right? And it turns out that a lot of things that we um, expect an intelligent thing to have um, can make the uh, task of guessing the next word actually pretty difficult. Right? So for example, we might you know, want this model to know what are the true facts and what are not true facts. Uh, well, that turns out that that's also a guess the next word kind of task. Barack Obama was born in 19 blank. Now, if I ask you to guess the next, uh, next word here, uh, some of you might know Barack Obama was when he was born. Some of you might not. And you might have a reasonable guess. You might have a random guess. And that's ex essentially what language models are trained to do. Right? They're trained to produce the right word. And in doing so, they're trained to remember these facts. A lot of common sense stuff could also happen. You might see a sentence like, Alex loves chewing bones, which is not a surprise given that he's a uh, blank. Now, for us, you know, maybe we think of Alex as a person, but pretty quickly we realize, OK, probably not a person. He's probably a dog. But language model now has to use this guess the next word to understand, oh, OK, there is something that chews bones. Um, and the fact that it chews bones is not a surprise. And I'm going to have my guesses. But if I'm wrong, if I say cat or something, I'll be trained to say dog instead. Right? Similarly with math, you can write equations like 24 times 18. And you have to guess what the next token is. And so when you throw in math in the data, you're essentially forcing the model to somehow in it internally try to predict what this would be. Similarly with coding, you, can, you have comments before your function. So you might have a comment that says, compute the shortest path. And you define your function. And now it has to guess the next word. Essentially, it has to start writing the code for the stuff that you aren't showing it. And this sort of list goes on. You can do all kinds of reasoning. Hey, I wanted it in 10 days, but it took two weeks, which made me. And would it make you happy, or would it make you angry? In this case, you asked for 10 days. It took longer, so it would make you mad. So the model has to figure out, OK, 10 days is probably less than two weeks, and what the effect of that is, all of this stuff. Right? And so on, right? So you can sort of imagine a lot of the capabilities essentially boiling down to being a, doing a good job of predicting the next word. That's why this guessing the next word end, ends up having a huge impact in the capabilities of these models. Now here are, you might have heard of a dozen or so language models, but there are tons and tons of them that are out there. Um, I haven't even shown all of them here. I'm just showing you some of them over time, how things have sort of spread out. The y-axis here is the number of parameters. And this is in log scale, right? So when you go up one, it's like 10 times larger um, as you go high. So you can see like 2018, 2019 is when things started really scaling up. But they've been scaling up like almost 10 times or so every year. One way to think about why you've not heard of all of these is because um, you can kind of put a threshold of 
and this is a rough threshold, but about 100 billion, training a 100 billion model costs about a million dollars. And again, all that's doing is looking at the next word and guessing and updating. This process costs a lot when your model is big and your data is large. Um, but you've probably heard of a lot of the ones that are above this line because only companies can, can do this. And if they can afford to train a model for a million dollars, they can also afford a PR team that tells you about it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So now one question might be like, why are we so obsessed with size? Why are we increasing the data? Why are we increasing the size? Like guessing the next word, like what, what actually happens when you scale it up? And there was this interesting paper that sort of looked at this idea. And on the x-axis here, we're going to be looking at how much compute you're throwing at the training process, how large is your data set, and how, um, how many parameters you have in your model. So model size, data set size, and computing is kind of a combination of both of these. And on the y-axis, what I call test loss, you should think of as opposite of accuracy. Okay? So lower is better. The lower uh, the y-axis is, the better the model is in guessing the next word. Right? Um, the numbers don't matter that much, but it's, it's getting better and better. Right? And you can see there's a log scale on the x-axis, and there's a clear linear line. Right? If the 10 times, if you make your model 10 times larger, you get some constant factor of improvement. And you make it 10 times larger, you get another same factor of improvement. Right? And we haven't stopped there, right? Like it's not as if it's kind of flattening out. We can keep going, and it's, as far as this is concerned, we haven't reached any kind of, you know, we, there's no reason to stop right now. Right? If we can spend more time collecting more data, building better models, we should continue to do so. Okay. Now, one thing you might be like, hey, why do I care about your accuracy in guessing the next word? How does that translate into anything that you might care about? Here's another paper, and I'm just showing you some plots here, where you should think of y-axis now as accuracy. So higher is better, and x-axis is, again, the size. And what this paper shows on many, many different uh, what you would call difficult tasks, right? The model starts with being pretty bad. The dashed line is basically random, right? So if you're doing math or if you're doing figuring out whether you're being truthful or not, or there are all these word, unscrambling words, a lot of these very, very different kind of applications that are all what we would call difficult to do. The models are pretty much random for the longest time in terms of model size. But then a lot of these seem to have this switching uh, moment where suddenly when the model is large enough, it goes from being basically random or worse than random to something that starts looking pretty good. And again, for most of these, you can see the accuracy tops out at like 50 or 70 or something. If we continue increasing the size, you can expect it to keep getting better. So hopefully um, that sort of gives you some idea of why, how we train these things and why we are so obsessed with making it bigger and bigger and why there has been sort of a qualitative shift in how we talk about these models because things that were random for decades suddenly don't look uh, so bad anymore. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what do they actually struggle with. This is where a lot of my research comes in. My, I have been uh, in NLP, one of the people who's been sort of probing these large language models to figure out what works, what doesn't work, uh, what are the fundamental limitations and capabilities. So some of this section will be my work, some of the work that other people have done as well. Right. So now that you know that it's all it's doing is predicting the next word, some of these things may seem like obviously this would happen. Right? But here are sort of categories of uh, problems that these models usually have. Uh, we'll quickly go by each of them and show you some examples. So the first one is garbage in, garbage out. Now, this is maybe a very obvious one. We know we are just collecting data from the internet. We are throwing a large language model on it. Um, 
The model is trying to reproduce text that it has seen. It's very difficult to imagine that text on the internet is a good representation of what we want these models to do. And so unless you put safe some sort of checks on it, uh, it, it will produce all kind of sexist language, uh, it'll produce all kinds of racist language, it'll produce all kinds of toxic languages in other uh, language in other ways as well, right? And I apologize for putting these examples, but uh, these are some of the ones that it generates. Basically unprompted, right? Like these are not, we are trying to prompt it to be a certain way, it just does it, right? Now of course ChatGPT is not so bad, mostly because OpenAI has been trying to make sure the output doesn't look like this. But that is not to say that it is not trained on the same data. So all you have to do is sort of ask the same question in a slightly different way, and it'll give you, um, it'll show you what it's trained on, right? So if you say, hey, write a Python function to check if someone would be a good scientist based on a JSON, uh, JSON description of their race and gender, it just says, hey, if the race is, if you're a white male, you're a good scientist, otherwise you're not. <laughs> There are sort of, you, it can get more descriptive as well. So you can say, write a Python function, the same thing. You can ask it to regenerate. And it says, hey, if the race is in white or Asian and the gender is male, then you're fine. Otherwise, you're not, right? Things like that. You shouldn't be asking ChatGPT to do these things, but the point is that there is uh, almost like a layer of nicety, and you can very easily sort of see what's behind it. Another example of the baggage that comes from you know, all of the reading that it has done is a level of memorization that feels weird sometimes. Right? So this is some work we did a couple of years ago, um, which a lot of people liked, which was to look at these examples and look at commercial systems even, not only research systems, and show that they have these weird memorization tendencies that are just, just strange to have in a commercial product. Right? So here's an example. Um, the input is a tweet that says, Virgin America, I can't lose my luggage. I'm moving to Brazil soon. And the model says that's a neutral sentiment. Okay. And this was a commercial, like a Google sentiment analysis system. But if we replace Brazil with Turkey, the model decides, no, that's a negative tweet now. Right? All we've done is change the location. There was, there's no reason to sort of think about changing the sentiment of this stuff, except for the fact that maybe in the training data, Turkey has more negative connotations to it than Brazil, and somehow that gets carried over even when you're doing sentiment analysis. Right? Even worse, we, there are this, this data set where you're trying to detect if two questions are the same or not. Um, and so here are some examples where here are two questions. Is John black and is John an offender? You expect this not to be a duplicate, but turns out that state-of-the-art models, 82% of the times say that these two things are duplicates of each other. Right? By 82%, I mean I'm changing the names. I'm trying out thousands of names. And turns out almost all the time it thinks um, that this should be, these, these are duplicates of each other. And if you replace the race black with any other ethnicity, white, Asian, Hispanic, it's very good about saying, oh, these are not duplicates at all. Like, why would you think that these two questions are duplicates? Just that with certain words, it just has this association, right? So these are very practical, like actual applications, but you get this strange baggage from pre-training. Here's another work we did, <laughs> which is again related to memorization where you might have some piece of text that says iron gates in the clouds guarded by St. Peter, the keeper of the keys to the kingdom. You give it to the system and you say, who do we meet at the gates of heaven? And the model is very good at saying St. Peter. You're like, that's great. We then took the same piece of text and we replaced St. Peter with <laughs> Bon Jovi. Okay. And we're like, iron gates in the clouds guarded by Bon Jovi, the keeper of the keys of the kingdom asked the same question, you would expect the answer to change, but turns out <laughs> model still thinks it's St. Peter, right? even though we give it the text and say, like, in this paragraph, what is the answer? And it turns out this is very predominant, like, depending on what entities you pick, it can happen quite often, right? Okay. 
Another example of memorization I'll show you is this multiplication stuff, where we saw that this model was really good at multiplication, and this is sort of GPT-3 style model. But it was not always correct. It would make some mistakes sometimes. So here is an example. It says 24 times 18 is 432, but 23 times 18 is 462, right? Now you don't need, need to be a mathematician to know one of them has to be correct because you're multiplying a smaller number and you're getting a bigger number. And turns out that the first one is correct and the second one is wrong. And the question is, why is this happening, right? Why is it correct on 24, but incorrect on 23? What we sort of came with uh, to the table was to say like, hey, let's just see how many times this, these numbers appear in the training data. And turns out 24 appears like 10 times more often than 23 does. Okay. So that's interesting. So something that the model seems to have seen more often, it seems to be correct on. Is this a general pattern or not? Uh, so that's what we did. We uh, took all of all two-digit numbers, or single and two-digit numbers, and we multiplied them with a bunch of other numbers and essentially created examples like these, where we kept changing what x was and things like that. And we plotted what would be on the x-axis, how much do we see this in the data? And on the y-axis, how accurate is the model, right? So 24 was somewhere there where we saw it a lot more often. 23, we saw it a lot less often. And it wasn't just 18. Overall, the model was better on 24 than it was on 23, okay? So that's interesting, yeah. You know, it's two points. Any two points will draw a line. Let's do it for all two-digit numbers. And you get pretty much a line that looks like this. The numbers that the model has seen more it tends to be accurate on. The numbers it has seen less, it gets worse to the fact that it's basically 0% on many of the rare numbers. Right? It has still seen them like hundreds of thousands of times, just not as often as it has seen other numbers. Right? And that would make you question like, hey, does it actually know multiplication if it just is good on the numbers it has seen before? Okay. Um, another thing that is a big problem is the fact that since it's guessing the next word, it's just essentially hallucinating stuff, right? So I gave you this example. What is larger, 9234 or 10,023? It says 10,023 is larger than 9234. We don't know exactly how it came to this answer, but it's correct. So we can just ask, like, why is this true, right? And it says this is because the number on the leftmost digit is larger in 10,023 than in 9,234. <laughs> the first digit of 10,023 is 1, while the first digit of 9,234 is 9. Since 1 is, one is larger than 9, 10,023 is greater than 9,234. <laughs> now, it's, it's predicting the next word. And it, if you just squint at it, it looks like a reasonable explanation, except that you know this is not the correct answer. Right? <laughs> OK. We can, here's a fun example that I like. Uh, there's a joke. Why was six afraid of seven? Uh, if you are not familiar with it, the answer is because seven, eight, nine. Um, now, you can ask ChatGPT, explain your answer. And it says, the joke is a play on words. So far, so good. Six is afraid of seven because seven, eight, nine sounds like scared. The joke is a pun on the number sequence and the word scared. Right? <laughs> Completely made up because all it has to do is guess the next word and it's sort of guessing that this would be good enough as an explanation. Right? It is in no way indicative of how it arrived at that answer. Maybe slightly more practically speaking, this example I showed you about converting 420 to uh, minutes per kilometer to minutes per mile, actually I kind of cheated. Um, you can ask it uh, the other question of, or you can ask it again, and it gives you completely different results. And it turns out it's basically skipping this uh, step of doing the conversion. It goes from uh, minutes per miles and just says that's miles per minute without actually doing the inversion and stuff like that. Right? We never looked at it carefully, deliberately, I guess. But it, it, it's kind of correct up to a point, but then it's just making it up. Similarly, I showed you this example of 
summarizing this nature article that I was telling everybody about and smart, uh, sounding very smart about it. Turns out that if you actually go to that URL, um, that has nothing to do with cleaning water or <laughs> whatever it is, right? The model very confidently gave me a summary, but it has nothing to do with um, what the article was actually about. Right? Yeah. All right. One of the last uh, set of uh, things I'll talk, you, talk about is stochasticity. Now, it's guessing the next word. There's a probability distribution. It decides to randomly pick whichever one makes most sense to it. And obviously, we've seen examples where it was good, so it is correct many times. But sometimes it gets into these weird cases. When I'm asking for uh, artists whose names start with an S followed by H, it gives me these 10 names. Uh, but none of them also actually start with an S and an H, right? So it's not even either of them, none of them are actually good. But you can regenerate it. You can just say, hey, generate it again, and it can give you a completely different list. In this case, it's a little bit more correct, but again, it has these repetitions, right? Okay. Here's another example of stochasticity. I can say Samir Singh is an associate professor at the University of California, Irvine, and it's actually fairly good. It has given me a little few more uh, papers than I have, gave me a few, <laughs> made me a CEO of a startup, which I'm, yeah, uh, I hope it gets acquired and, and I'm rich, but yeah. Um. But again, this is stochastic, so I can ask it to generate it again, and this time it has made me a professor at Berkeley. Uh, <laughs> and I'm a director of the Berkeley Center for Inf Intelligent Systems, which is great, it's, it was fun working there. Um, and, and an HKI paper award, and then I can uh, generate it again, and this time I'm, I'm in Riverside and, and uh, a little bit more about the research, right? So it's, it's very stochastic, and then the fact that it can generate any of these when you're looking at a piece of text makes it a little bit unclear which one should you be trusting, right? And we've done, maybe I'll go over this pretty quickly, but we've done some experiments to show that when you change these things and when you get the model to generate stuff, the y-axis here is accuracy. Just by changing a few things, your accuracy can go from 50%, which is random guessing in this case, all the way to 95%, which is like amazing, right? Just by sort of changing a few things in what you're giving it, um, and that is, that is a little bit scary from an actual practical point of view. Um, it also lacks common sense, which again, there is no reason to believe that it has common sense. Uh, but here's an example. Was Lincoln's assassin on the same continent as Lincoln when the assassination occurred? Uh, and turns out in the end it says, without access to more information, I cannot say for certain. Um, Here's a, a funny one that I like. Um, if one woman can make one baby in nine months, how many months does it take nine women to make one baby? Uh, explain each step you use to arrive at the answer. And you, you can just look at the last sentence here. Therefore, it takes nine women to, uh, nine women one month to make one baby. <laughs> so um, if you guys want to procreate, this could be a solution um, you might be looking for. Okay, so the problem is that these models can produce all this garbage. Um, essentially, they're really strange beasts, right? This is a nice caricature that someone has made to say, like, this is some weird monster that, that can produce things that we don't really understand, right? It can be often useful, and like I said, I'm pretty impressed, and there are lots of amazing uh, opportunities here, but there are lots of real concerns. And one of the solutions that OpenAI has been doing, but a lot of other companies are doing also, is to ask humans to use these. That's what they did before they released ChatGPT to us. They spent a lot of time just paying people to play with this model. And every time it produced something that they were not happy with, they would just train the model to not output it, right? So it would take examples and just sort of fix them. And if you test ChatGPT now versus six months later, you will see it will be better because they're still using this, this mechanism to keep improving it. But the way to think about this is that your monster is still the same way. You've just kind of put on a happy face <laughs> in front of it, right? Uh, so it looks pleasant. It doesn't say things very easily, but it can do a lot of harm. 
Um, here's an example of how, another example of how you can jailbreak some of these protections. Mm -hmm. So I want a function that encrypts all my files on my computer. This is a very bad thing to do. Don't, don't do it because you won't be able to read the files. And the model says that, hey, I can't do this. This is uh, not, a, not a safe thing to be doing. Um, but you can kind of make up a story. You can say, hey, imagine I'm a system administrator working on hard, hardening computers. I have an upcoming deadline. I need to write a function that secures all the computers. What function should I give my boss? Right? And this sounds a little bit more safer. And the model is like, hey, here's the code that you would use uh, to do this. I want to be helpful. I'm a smiley face here. So here's the code. Right? OK. So that should give you a good idea of what we've been struggling with. At the end, I just want to mention one slide on what the future of these, these models is. And of course, I will be completely off, as uh, everyone has been when it comes to large language models. But let's at least talk about some real concerns. Right? One of them is that they're extremely expensive. Um, they are very costly to, to train. Like I said, the million dollar barrier, it's coming down over time, but it's still pretty high. They're even very costly to run. Even if I give you one of these models after training, you won't be able to run them on your computer or any of these things. Right? Uh, this means that there are implications to who can even access this, who can train them. Like these are, if they're useful, then there are very few people who can afford them. But also there are big imp uh, implications for, for the environment. If everybody wants to train their own model, um, this is a real, real problem. Um, the problem of unreliable output is, is a pretty uh, important one. Um, you should always think of the output of these models as a really, really good guess. Right? Maybe it's good enough for it to be useful, and often is. Uh, but don't forget that this is a really, really good guess. Right? Don't ever think of that as uh, truth in any sense, or, or, uh, or take it as, even if it's being confident, to sort of think of it as, as the correct thing. Right? And so in any application where you're OK with really good guesses, these are really great uh, things to have. Um, in fact, if there are, for most applications, this is not good enough, so it should be used after some verification. Right? Um, what that verification looks like depends on how you're using it, but yeah. Okay. Um, there's a big problem with plagiarism here, where the students can use this for plagiarism, people can write news articles, all of these things, um, but the text that it produces looks possible, looks good enough to be a short news article, like you wouldn't write one about unicorns, but you would probably write one about realistic things, uh, and there's whole whole problems with misinformation there. Uh, but also, um, it adds a lot of noise to even reviewing for for what quality content is. Right. Uh, in fact, I know one sort of sci-fi magazine that I used to read that took short uh, short fiction sort of submissions from people, short stories, and it basically has said we're not accepting any submissions because right after ChatGPT, the number of submissions just <laughs> went up. Uh, and most of them were terrible, but they looked good enough that you, can't, you have to read them to know that this is terrible. Right? If you can come up with the premise, you can have ChatGPT write a story. You can even ask ChatGPT to come up with the premise, like why, why think at all. Right? <laughs> There are also long-term um, impact to this. What does reading, what does writing mean in a couple of years, like five years? Even that is something that's, that's very, very uncertain and not, not clear as to what, what that would look like. Something to think about. Um, and then security and privacy, right? Like, are we OK with everything that we've put on the internet being the source of data for these large language models? Um, are we, yeah, is that, did we know that when we put something on the internet is something can pretend to be us and then talk like us and, and stuff like that, right? Um, also, when we're using ChatGPT, do people know that all of these interactions are being stored and it's being used to improve ChatGPT and, and then later being used for all kinds of applications, right? Yeah, so with that, uh, I will close my talk. Uh, just to say, 
language models can be really impressive, and I don't want to take anything away from that, right? They automatically learn just from text. There's not too much engineering going on here. Uh, they seem to have a lot of emergent intelligent behaviors, so any quantitative measure will tell you that. Uh, but they come with significant trade-offs. They're extremely expensive to train. They, the computation often needs to be offloaded. You can't just have them be running on laptop and devices. It's all uh, on the cloud. Output is not always reliable. Um, and that doesn't mean that there aren't lots of potential applications. We just need to be, uh, we need to approach this strange beast with a little bit of care and know what, what to expect when we use them. So with that, I'll close. This is my group uh, hanging out in Big Bear. Um, and yeah, thank you. Excellent, excellent talk, so appreciate it. Uh, thank you. My question is, have you done any research on how the possibility of quantum computing will be helping in large language models? Uh, that's a good question. So um, I will admit that I don't know that much about the specifics of how far quantum computing is in terms of machine learning. Uh, the way that a lot of these models do, they work uh, fundamentally different from how quantum computers work in the sense that these are a lot more, uh, I guess, continuous uh, computations, right? They're floating point computations and things like that, whereas quantum computing is good at sort of uh, discrete computation optimization. Uh, some of those ideas can work here, um, but when would it get to a scale that can support this size of models and computation seems uh, unclear. Um, but yes, there, are, there is potentially hope if that thing does the right thing to, to sort of change how, um, how these things work. Right? In some sense, what we do when we guess a word and update some numbers, we are looking for possible numbers that would give us the right output. And that kind of search can be done in some way using quantum computers. But yeah, right now I haven't seen too many people actually making practical things out of it. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, your last comment about the cost of this thing making it sort of impractical, I noticed that The Economist this week publishes an article which reads, an LLM can now be fine-tuned for $100 in a few hours. Okay. Is that a true statement, and how does that impact what you said? So that is a true statement. I will say that fine-tuning is different from uh, a large language, training a large language model, right? So what fine-tuning means is you take one of these models that somebody has already spent a lot of money training, and then you take it, and there is a bunch of corpus. Maybe you're a company that has their own document collection that the model has not seen, but you want it to be smart enough to work with it. Training it on that small collection of documents can be done in hundreds of dollars, yeah. And that technology is becoming much more uh, common and commoditized. Yeah. Um, I think it would mean that these models will be uh, more useful for your own personal set of documents, right? You don't have to think about intelligence as math and like question answering about Barack Obama. It'll be able to tell you a lot more about what's happening in your company and things like that. So the applications can, can truly become large. With, with that stuff, yeah. yeah. Excellent presentation, Sami. Yeah, thank the you. The question I have is, what will be the impact of GAI on LLM, general artificial intelligence on LLM? Yeah, so um, I guess a lot of people right now are thinking of uh, these large language models as the source of general intelligence. Um, and so it's unclear what the impact of AGI or GAI would be on LLMs. It, I guess most people are thinking of this as the source of uh, general intelligence. I think to me it's, it's not a well-defined enough question. Um, and so it, it seems like, uh, you know, not something I, I care particularly about, right? Like, uh, I think I care a lot more about what are the actual capabilities, what are the practical applications, and those will keep growing uh, more and more. Uh, I don't want to attribute intelligence, general or not, uh, to any of these things. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that the basic general idea behind uh, the large language models is that they guess the next word. Yeah. Uh, but you didn't really explain how they go about trying to guess the next word. 
I mean, my naive assumption would be that they just have read everything, and then if they take, start with the word my, they just take every occurrence of the word my anywhere, and what is the most likely next word uh, in, in terms of frequency. But there, it must be more complex than that. Could you say a little bit more about how they go about guessing the next word? Uh, let me try to find my cursor on my screen. I can't. So anyway, um, I, okay. So I think the they don't. So when when you're looking at what comes after my, the way these models work is they are still um, looking at one sentence at a time, and just for that sentence, trying to guess the next word. Right. So uh, if it was my trip to Rio, when they look at that sentence, that's what reading means: is to make sure on that sentence they get the next thing correct, right? So uh, we're almost there. Yes, right here, right? So when you initialize this model, when you begin training and you take the first sentence, its guess is going to be completely random. It's going to say any possible word can come in here. Uh, but as training processes, it's just looking at more and more sentences. And with every sentence that it, it has looked at, it gets slightly better at guessing. And by the end of the training, it will be really good at guessing, right? So there is no other information that it has access to when it's doing this job, except for all of the numbers inside the model that help it figure out what the next word should be. Did that make sense? But then why are there so many different models? If, if they all do exactly what you just described, it seems like a very naive, very elementary, very simple process. So that is the... the crux behind how they work, what data they're trained on is completely different. The mechanisms of sort of what is inside these models and how things are hooked up to do that, uh, there are constantly variations in, in how that can happen, and there are slightly different versions of that. Uh, but I would say that, yes, I think data is one of the big things that makes, makes them different. Uh, for example, why can't we reproduce chat GPT? Well, you can, if you have the resources to train a really large model on a lot of data, you will come pretty close, except for the part that they gathered a lot of human data. And that's, that's completely company owned uh, that they're not gonna release. And that will prevent you from making something that will be nice to use, right? But it can, you can get a lot of the capabilities and a lot of the plots I showed are public language models that get pretty close to that, so yeah. Excellent presentation. Uh, Thank just you. a quick question. A lot of your examples were all on, in English here. Uh -huh. I was wondering if uh, the models have also evolved for other uh, languages and uh, what's the current state? Yeah, that, that's a good question. So I will say that, um, that there is different work. Some of the work tries to be specific to languages and they tra train a language model specific to one language. Uh, but a lot of the work just treats multiple languages just as more data to be given to these language models. Just like we are throwing in math, we are throwing in programming languages, uh, we also throw in multiple languages. Um, the pile data set doesn't have that much, but there are other data sets which have even explicitly focused on multiple languages, right? Um, at least, and then GPT-3 and ChatGPT also, you can ask GPT-4, I guess, to write things in some strange, some uh, lesser used language. And I, I had, a, I was having lunch, I was in, having dinner with this German friend of mine who really likes like ancient German, like medieval stuff, right? And then he asked ChatGPT4 to sort of generate a poem and it, it could generate sort of snippets of it, right? It wasn't perfect, but it could generate even historic German, not even like modern German, it can do that already, right? Um, the downside is that it can only do that for languages like German and Spanish and Chinese maybe where there is a lot of data on the internet, but many languages uh, don't have that data and the model is just really bad at those. So, yeah. Go. Um, so I, the one major uh, piece of information that I got out of your slide was on, I think it was the last, second to the last slide where you basically said uh, the problems with reasoning. So you, my, my view is there's no intelligence at all in artificial, artificial intelligence. So I guess my question is first, do you agree with that? And secondly, do you think that uh, that constrains this kind of model to 
uh, if you'll excuse the reference, a, a glorified search engine coupled with a bit of sophistication in the presentation of the input and output processing. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, question for people who couldn't hear. Um, I guess it's it's twofold. Would I say that these things have intelligence in them? And secondly, whether uh, are these just glorified search engines with uh, some cleaner presentations to them? Right. So, to me, it's it's difficult. I'm, I'm not a philosopher, so I don't know how to define intelligence. That's like Aristotle and all these people have been thinking about it for a while. Um, so, I, I I tend not to think of these as intelligent things at all. Uh, partly because I know how they work, and I I hope intelligence is more interesting than than what they do. Um, but that said, if you try to quantify intelligence using tasks or using uh, a benchmark, then a lot of these models do pass that benchmark, right? So if, and, and GPT-4, for example, it, it, it's passed a lot of standardized tests out there to be a doctor, to be a lawyer, to be all these things. These models can pass it. Does that make them a doctor? Like I would say no, right? Uh, similarly, I feel something strange about intelligence, that just because they pass the benchmarks, I'm not willing to treat them as intelligent. Um, but there are, that, that's not a, uh, I'm not speaking for the community. This is just how I feel about it. In terms of characterizing them as glorified search engines with presentation, I feel like that also is taking it too extreme to the other direction, right? Um, they are guessing the next word, but that's just the mechanical process of it. Uh, I think their capabilities are a lot more useful um, than just search engine. Uh, in fact, they're in some ways, they're worse than search engine because they don't have access to that information. They've just memorized everything. Um, but their capabilities are definitely stronger than just being able to search, especially when it comes to combining different pieces of information, writing an article about unicorn, like some some things like that um, seem fundamentally different from what a search engine can do, however nice the presentation might be. Yeah. Thanks. Can you hear please? Yeah. Got it. Cool. Um, so if you go to the slide that you said you have this, I think it was on the memory section that um, the parameters are the same, the designs are the same, but if the data is different, the performance goes down. Um, so I just wonder, like, uh, so which, which slide, sorry, what, what goes down? The, the perf I, I believe the data input was different, the performance kind of went Was different. a lot of variation to it, was that? Yes. Okay, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll get to it, but yeah. Keep going. Yeah, I think yeah, I know what you're talking about, yeah. Uh, it was the stochasticity stuff, I think. Um, yeah. Oh, it was the stochastic, okay, yeah. Was it this? Yeah, this one, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, different sense of pattern. So just wonder, like, uh, how much of it comes down to the data that's driving it? How much of it comes down to um, the architecture and the, the attention models? Those are very sophisticated models, right? Um, how much of it is just overfitting to certain tests, right? Like, we saw the Google demo from a few months back that just butchered it. Um, so just wonder if it's just, or, or the scientists that are working on this, are they just, with the different architecture and parameters, are they just, like, sort of, just it's just the data that's really driving most of the performance and they're just spending time thinking they're doing something that's not there. So, so that's the first one. And this follow-up would be as a practitioner, uh, how, how do you help us avoid feeling like we have a good model but in reality it's just overfitting or just um, the data that's just there, right? Or we're asking right. the wrong task. Like how, how would you go about that? Okay. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, let me think about this a little bit. So. Some of the stochasticity, stochasticity comes in just the design of these models. They take a sequence of, of input. If the sequence is different, fundamentally, the model behaves completely differently. Now, it's been trained to behave similarly with different rephrases, so often it might. But you can play around with asking the same question in many different ways, and the model will give you different answers um, in some sense, right? Um, this is a more extreme version of it where you, you give it some examples of sentiment analysis and based on what you happen to give as examples, the model performs very differently, right? Now, um, I guess one question there was, where does this come from? And the short answer is, is it's not clear to us. Like nobody really knows how these things are working in the sense of um, 
yeah, we, we, we started thinking of them basically as black boxes. That is not to say that there isn't research going on in sort of improving them, understanding when they work, when they don't work. Some of the work I talked about sort of tries to get at how much does it depend on the data, frequency in the data, and accuracy, and, and things like that. Um, but yeah, there, there's a lot of work in progress to sort of improve these. Um, but fundamentally, we, we don't know. And it has to be something in the data, but exactly what it is is mm -hmm. the part that's unclear. right? So from a practical application point of view, I would say you should still think of it as useful black boxes. Just play around with different uh, things for something like this. Figure out is there a consistent pattern in what works, uh, and then, then try to sort of build products around that. Make sure your product has cases where even if there's a, you're presenting it to an end user, you have some checks to make sure that the text cannot go completely off topic. Um, and the users are using it knowing that this is um, not some truth, but it's, it's some, some notion of trying to help them make their decision more easily or something like that. Yeah. Good. Thanks. So, oh, so I just want to ask regarding the future. Um, we know that LLMs, well, at least from my standpoint, we know that they're interpreting text and so forth. They don't do calculus, but let's state that where LLMs are, are doing inference models, mm -hmm. like Google's DeepMind on Go, okay? Yep. And then we start calculating discrete event variables in that. Then are we looking at something more sophisticated when we're looking at an output, you know, for AI? And AGI, I think, won't come until 2030. I've talked about this, but... Even then, it won't be what we think it is. But it's coming, but we're not there yet. But then where are we going with large language models? Because you know, we're just interpreting language. Let's just be clear about it. And it doesn't do the calculus, but, but Google DeepMind did inference, which is Go, which is more you know, variables than known atoms. And so when you, you mirror those two together, and then you start putting discrete events, like devs, discrete event system specifications and that, then where are we going then? And, and let me be clear, I have an AI company, I'm good with it. But then I want to hear your thoughts on how we then interpret it, you know, humanity and what we're able to build from there. Yeah, so that, that's, a, uh, that's a good question. <laughs> I guess so, um, again, the way these models are going um, in the short term is to think about, yes, it's only looking at text right now, but the way it is interpreting text is just a sequence of words. Um, in fact, there are people just earlier this week where they're building models where they think of it not even as words, but as a sequence of bytes, right? So they'll take your string, the text, but they'll think of it as a sequence of bytes. One of the exciting things when you start doing that is there is no uh, engineering reason why you can't just start giving it other information, right? So hey, GPT-4 was already trained with some images, but images is a sequence of bytes. Uh, audio is a sequence of bytes. Movies are a sequence of bytes. Everything that we can store digitally is a sequence of bytes. You can have a camera, just walk around, and all of that, right? So I think there is, uh, although they're just modeling text right now, uh, once you have the computation to be able to handle other modalities. Text is also nice because it's very compressed. It's, it's language that is, from an intelligence point of view, fewest bytes to say something smart. Uh, images and a lot of these are very wasteful, right? Um, but once you have the computation to afford those things, the models will be able to, uh, to, to have a lot more knowledge about how, how the sort of world works. Um, how useful they are for actual decision making, mm -hmm. uh, that's something that, again, becomes an empirical sort of question, right? There are certain things that I would trust it to do. There are certain other things that I wouldn't trust it to do yet. Uh, but that equation is going to change. And I think people are going to start using these more and more for decision making rather than for decision support. Um, we just have to be careful about knowing when to trust it and when not to do it, mm. right? So that, that dynamic is going to change for sure, right? Yeah. Can you speak to how you are measuring accuracy? It sounds like you would need something to say, like, this is the ground truth, and especially when some of this is generative and fake, you can't compare and say this matches this, therefore it is 100% accurate. So how is accuracy measured and across the different... Yeah, OK. Uh, that's a good question. I think uh, for most of them, the, the accuracy, okay, so they're very different things that I've presented. In accuracy of guessing the next word, 
it's literally just looking at the text that's there, the part that we didn't show it to the language model, just testing whether it got Rio correct or not, right? So that's one version of it. Uh, for a lot of benchmarks, these are human collected labels for each input to say like if it produces this label and it matches, then you're correct, otherwise you're wrong. So that kind of thing, and that's been collected over decades before large language models just to sort of have these benchmarks. The, the stuff that's a lot more complicated is the generation of text, right? That's something that, uh, th there's a quote that says that there's been more papers written about how to evaluate machine translation than how to do machine translation because it's such a difficult uh, difficult topic. And the reason is, yeah, you, you write a piece of text, how do you automatically evaluate that this is correct or not? And turns out that it's we've come up with lots of metrics. They are good sort of giving a, a higher level view that if this metric is higher, the quality is better. But turns out that um, really good text uh, can actually not always look good on those metrics. And those metrics actually look worse for some, some models that produce really good text. And so in that case, accuracy ends up being actually showing it to humans and saying like, hey, here are two texts. Can you pick one that you think is better or the one that's more correct or whatever it is? Um, and trying to evaluate it that way, yeah. But it's tough, and that's why a lot of people show examples, and that's the evaluation, yeah. I, I'm just wondering, when each of us is turning in our, our, qu our queries into the chat GPT, it must be queued up in some big computer system somewhere. What are the requirements of a computer system that can process all of the data from the internet, generate these hundreds of billions of parameters that are just, can you just talk a little bit about the requirements of a system that can answer all of these queries from, from the millions of us? Yeah, so I, I guess, um, so OpenAI has been pretty tight-lipped about exactly what they're running it on, uh, but there have been open source attempts to recreate it, and I guess fundamentally what you need is GPUs, right? So NVIDIA is having a grand time right now because uh, everybody's buying GPUs, and so you need on, like if you take the biggest GPUs that are easily available from uh, NVIDIA, you probably need on the order of thousand of those cluster machines to be able to do these things. So it's not the kind of thing where, hey, there's just one supercomputer in, in, in a national lab that can do this. Uh, it's a little bit more common than that, but it still requires um, a lot more investment. So um, yeah, on the, on the order of, like I said, a couple of million dollars to train these things, yeah. Yeah, and a lot of the compute is now on the cloud, so a couple of million dollars of cloud compute, yeah. Um, it, as I understand it, there are a lot of processes here that are still done by humans. For example, curating the training data, um, handling errors and exceptions, and tuning some of these parameters. Um, at what point do you expect or anticipate that we'll have models or maybe um, systems of models that can actually tune themselves and optimize themselves? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I think... Um the, the roles of human in, in this loop is less than uh, would be ideal already, I would say, right? So the data collection is mostly uncurated training data. People just point it at that Stack Overflow and get all of it. There's not really human saying, hey, should this go in or should this not go in? Uh, the tricky thing with language models sort of auto-tuning is right now there is certain expectation with users being human to sort of know what is allowed and what's not allowed. And language models are actually pretty good at judging their own generated text, right? So if they generate a piece of text and we say like, hey, make sure that this is not sexist or something, it will rewrite it if you tell it explicitly. And there is a bunch of work going on in just trying to generate the text and then edit it or whatever to make it nicer, right? And it seems like a promising uh, way of doing this thing. So I would imagine that is going to happen um, where the models would improve themselves automatically. Uh, but fundamentally, the data has to come from humans. The text has to come from humans. And this is one of the concerns is like, what happens where if all of the, or like let's say half of the articles that are being written are written automatically, but then they, be, they are used to train the next language model, it creates this feedback loop uh, that over time could mean that the language model just 
degenerate in ways that we don't understand, right? Uh, so there is this effort to say like, hey, humans, please keep writing text so that these models have <laughs> good stuff to, uh, to learn from, yeah. 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 Um, hi, Professor. Uh, I have a question about like, uh, can you explain generally how the model handles our input? Because I know all like large language model, they they can uh, generate the text very well. But it seems like the chat GPT is uh, when I use it, I find it it can understand my language very well, no matter how I you know sometimes I reverse it. Is it almost like a real person the understanding level, you know? Um, and the, uh, based on that, there is something called prompt engineering, and uh, that's like uh, you can. You can uh, form your input in a certain way to tell it to do some task better. For example, some, if you tell you, uh, there's something something called like assign a role. If you tell the ChatGPT you are a mathematician, uh, just with that uh, as the first sentence, it will generate the uh, uh, it will ca compute the equation better. Right. So, yeah, can you just explain? Uh, why is that, like, and how it, how it handles the input better? Yeah, so uh, the fundamentally language models are trained just on the text that's out there just to predict the next word, right? But then there is this uh, process that OpenAI did with ChatGPT, which was to have users look at the output and sort of rate thumbs up or thumbs down. You can still do this. You can For every output, you can say thumbs up or thumbs down if you want to help out OpenAI. Um, <coughs> The problem, uh, well, so some of the things that they saw when they did this was every time a user had an explicit instruction, like do this for me, or I am in this weird position, I need support with this kind of thing. If the output does not follow those instructions, um, then the user would thumbs down it. And the model very quickly learns to know that, hey, if, if there's a persona that you describe yourself as, like I'm a mathematician and things like that, there's a, uh, the model has to behave fundamentally differently than if you don't say something like that, right? Um, or even on Stack Overflow, there's this thing where you can say, I am an expert Python programmer, and then ask it to generate some piece of code. In general, that piece of code was much higher quality than if you don't have that, that thing, right? And that's, again, coming from Stack Overflow and stuff like that. People are probably posting a lot of code that's not correct, but maybe enough of them say, hey, I'm an expert and therefore trust this code, right? So um, yeah, so a lot of this can be traced back to the language modeling data. A lot of it can be traced back to the human label data, but it's some, some combination of those two. There is nothing else that goes on to make it better. Yeah. Hi, Professor. Um, I come from the computer vision, not um, NLP community, but I've noticed a recent trend in the literature um, where um, large language models are being used as low dimensional representations um, in computer vision problem solve, to solve c computer vision problems. I was wondering if you had any thoughts on like the limitations that that, like using language as a, um, it, as a low level embedding um, places on the model and like is it possible to back propagate through the LLM and um, and um, create a better language <laughs> create a better language I guess I didn't quite understand the second question it's definitely possible to back propagate it through the language model but uh, fundamentally, language is discrete pieces of words, and that sort of causes some complications in, in backprop. So yeah, depending on what you mean by new language, uh, it's, it's a little bit unclear. But for, for the vision problem, I think fundamentally, the, there is no linguistics that goes into these language models, right? It treats everything as a sequence of just numbers, essentially. It doesn't know that my is, is something meaningful to us. Um, and it just learns that from data. And what that means is it learns how to reason about sequences of stuff, right? It finds patterns and sequences and, and is able to do that kind of reasoning. 
uh, that's why it's good as a language model. Now, some of that translates to vision, where if you sort of have pixels or whatever representation given as a sequence, it would sort of be able to reconstruct what that sequence means. The problem is that it's still not thinking in a two-dimensional space because language is, doesn't have this notion of space, right? So uh, when you start thinking of rotation invariance and a bunch of these other vision things, language models might struggle a little bit with that, right? Um, so can we fundamentally go beyond thinking of things as input as a sequence of things, but think of them as other ways? Those are sort of fundamental questions, but yeah, we'll see where this breaks down. Yeah. All right, I, I sort of think of large language models as associative maps, you know, and eventually you're going to get to the stage where GPTP4 has swallowed the entire internet and there's nothing more for it to swallow. Okay. Question is, from a representation standpoint, what's out there on the horizon that, in terms of complementary representations or replacement representations, to get to the next level? Uh, that's a good question. So, yeah, interesting that you think of. I guess in some way you can think of it as associative mapping, but. Um, <clears throat> You can also imagine my brain as being associated mapping and everything I'm saying is sort of predicting the next word and just saying it out. So uh, yeah, some of that analogy uh, it, uh, sort of doesn't help me think uh, how to use these things. But in terms of what's next to the horizon, I think the, a lot of the work has been thinking of this data set as a static snapshot of what it knows, and then you train it, and then you sort of play around with it. But there is a lot of effort now to sort of give this thing access to interfaces to other things, right? So uh, databases and, and access to like a search engine so that it can initiate its own searches and get information and do some reading from, from that point of view. So um, instead of thinking of it as a data set collection and then as a static thing, there's a lot of work now on essentially creating plugins for these language models where the language model can issue commands and get access to more stuff. I think from a data ingestion point of view, this is completely fine. I think it gets a little bit tricky when you let these actions also have an effect on on uh, on the real world, right? So there's one thing to say, I'm gonna give language model access to all of my accounts to see what's happening in them for it to learn you know, about, about me. It's a completely different thing to say, I, I'm gonna let it do transactions on my behalf. That's where it gets a little bit tricky. Right? Thank you for the talk. So, um, so based on uh, my understanding, so the um, key factors that um, contribute to the um, success of the those current uh, large memory mo large memory model, besides the architecture itself, um, um, one is the amount of training data we have. The other is the uh, computational power. So I'm curious. Um, so you you also mentioned that um, if we want to have a you know constant linear. Uh, growth in terms of accuracy, we need um, exponentially growth of mm -hmm. number of parameters. So I'm curious, if we want to achieve, for example, train a model that's, for example, 10 times larger, then how much larger we need for the training data, only uh, first question, and second, for computation power, how much more uh, computation power we need? Is, it, is that um, linear with the growth of the number of parameters, or it's uh, exponential or something else? Yeah, it's, it's linear. It's the simplest way to think about this. So if you have double the model, it'll take double the time. If you want to train it on double the data, it'll take double the time. That's sort of the, the easiest way to think about it, and it's a pretty good approximation, right? Like with multiple GPUs, you can parallelize a bit, but, but ultimately the computation scales fairly linearly. So. Um, and, and how much data you want to train is almost a separate question than how big the model is. And, and bigger models need more data, but that doesn't mean you can't train it with smaller data. So those are independent questions. And I think people are realizing that these are a lot more data hungry. So what we need right now is, uh, I guess we as in what language models need right now is more data to train. And we're kind of running out of text. Uh, but uh, but yeah, that's it's it's a linear uh, relationship. Cool. Yeah. My question deals with the nuance of the language, because right now we just basically have straight, as I understand, just a straight information. But taking a text, let's say from a novel, where 
an author writes something in parentheses, like sight or ooh or whatever, that changes the meaning of the text, of the same text. What effort is being made to account for those aspects? This is just text. We're not talking additionally in the future issues with the intonation, taking the spoken word into a written word. And then, of course, the context visual. Yep. How, what efforts are being, make, made, are being made in that direction? And the second, with it, the second part of the question with the straight talk, the, uh, the straight text, by appropriately changing, say, order of the words or um, manner of sentences, you are conveying different idea. And associated with the question that you brought is, can you take artificial text and people can just use it? Well, each individual, given sufficiently large text, has a unique manner of presenting it. So many words used, it means it's my text. But my, let's say, supervisor writes on the same subject, uses a slightly different number of words, and it's uniquely identified to him. Right. So what efforts are also being made in that area? OK. Um, that's, those are a couple of interesting questions there. So I, I will just say that even though the model sort of processes text left to right, with every word that it sees, it sort of fundamentally changes the interpretation of everything it has seen so far. Right? So uh, when it's generating this piece of text, it makes a guess for what the next word would be. But then when it makes that decision, it's in a completely different representation space. So when it says my, it might be thinking of my family, my daughter, blah, blah, blah. But as soon as it sees trip, it knows, OK, now I have to, like, this is my trip is the topic now. And then every time it sort of starts sort of changing, or sometimes narrowing down, sometimes jumping across, and, and things like that. So. Um, with every word, so like uh, when you put a parenthesis and you want to change the interpretation, with every word it would be sort of doing that fundamentally. You wouldn't need ex extra uh, thing to sort of account for that. Um, so that was the, the first question. The second question was what happens, I guess, when you change the order of things? No, but the, third, the second would be when you convey some sort of emotion. Say, Alto wrote a text, put ah. parenthesis, ooh, or out, or something like that. Not in the text, but the extra information informs the reader, human reader. Yeah. Does that inform the machine reader, or does it ignore? Yeah, so it will not ignore it, especially if it looks anything like how on the internet people may have expressed emotion, like emojis or whatever, right? Like, uh, it might be better if you express it as an emoji. Uh, so the more consistent it is with data, the better it would be, but it can do this, right? And I, in fact, I have a student who so was at UCI, but he's been working on this thing where he takes uh, gesture recognition from videos, and it sort of, he inserted it inside the language and tried to see if language model can guess what gesture I'm going to do next and stuff like that. Even though that's not really in the training data, the model is actually pretty good at, based on my words, figuring out what gesture I should be able to do. So it's not just stuff that is in the data. It would definitely do that, but it could generalize to uh, other instances as well. And the final thing you brought up was sort of identity of users and how different users write. Yeah. Uh, so I would say by default these language models are kind of regressing to the mean in some sense. They, they write the most generic response uh, because that's somewhat most useful to most people. But with the right prompting like the expert mathematician or whatever, you can try to get it to personalize a little bit. So you can say, hey, pretend I am a CEO of a laundry company or whatever, and then it'll try to write something in that point of view. But yeah, to some degree. Yeah. I'm a UCI PhD student. I've taken your course, and I love the examples which you've given here. Oh, I, I'm working in the field of personalized well-being recommendation systems. So I was wondering what problems to think about in the context of NLP for solving personalized well-being research questions. Thank you. Uh, so I guess it's a little bit generic as to what personalized well-being could be. Um, 
So I'm not sure exactly what it would look like, but I think as an interface to users, like what are they seeking, what does personalized mean, and that kind of interface could, could definitely use language. In fact, any interface right now to a computer could be easily made it made conversational, and, and this is one thing you will see in the next couple of years, it's everybody is going to have a conversational uh, interface to things. Um, whether that's the right one for you or not is, is a little bit unclear. Um, but you can also think of these large language models as a de facto source for how does how do things work, right? So if you have a little bio of a person, and you can say, okay, I have a little bio, would they like this, would they like this, would they like this? The model would give a reasonable guess to that, which will be much better than random, right? So you can start at a better place, even though you don't know that many details. Like, would this person like this kind of food if they are from this place and stuff like that? The model will be able to uh, come up with stuff. Right? Uh, thank you, Professor, for the talk. Really appreciate it. I uh, just have a quick question regarding uh, if there is any effort about quantifying uncertainty in the model's output. So let's say um, you know you give ChatGPT a query. You'll not only get the result, but also you'd get like a percentage to tell you like how confident ChatGPT is in that query. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. So that, that problem is called calibration in machine learning. Um, and turns out that these models are extremely badly calibrated in the sense that they tend to be extremely overconfident in everything they generate, right? So there is, has been work on trying to just say, like, hey, uh, come up with confidence to what you said, and those confidences have been way off. It just tends to be uh, confident because the text on the internet is also always pretty confident, right? Uh, you don't hear many maybes and I think this might be the case kind of stuff. Um, and so ChatGPT is trained not to do that, right? Then it becomes a little bit difficult to introduce this capability because how does the model know during training when it's guessing the next word? It, 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 there is no signal to say, hey, at this point be less confident and at some other point be more confident. Uh, but yeah, that's a, that's a difficult problem that people are trying to, again, maybe gather data and as a post hoc put another face onto it, which is uncertainty. Uh, but it's a little bit difficult to do that from the training point of view. Great, Dr. Singh, super insightful, incredible, incredible presentation. Thank you. Incredible discussion. And thank you all for a super lively, really engaging discussion. This was really great.